right. Well, this is an MS Neuro TV virtual program. Uh, we have been doing MS Neuro TV uh, from years ago where we were recording it all and then just playing it back as a recorded version and having the doctor come on. Oh, I thought that, that was a big bottle of beer. My God. All right. So my name is Stuart Schlossman and you all know me already. And if you don't, well, you should. So let's just continue on here. All right. Our sponsors for tonight, we have Bristol Myers Squibs and Bristol Myers Squibb and Biogen, all right? And we always want to thank our supporters virtually and otherwise, so I want to give them a round of applause. All right, we got a lot of people online, and that's great because tonight, you know, we're doing this great program with Dr. Aaron Boster. And, you know, those that that see Dr. Boster online, I mean, he's online with a lot of our programs. And why? Because he likes the way we create, you know, why we're creating, you know, what we're doing for the MS community. So Dr. Boster is is um, well known to our MS News and News uh, attendees. We've been working with him now for seven years or eight years. I still remember the first time when he scared the hell out of me, but that's another topic. All right. And um, all right. So we're going to have Dr. Boster. Dr. Boster is going to be speaking tonight about telehealth. All right. It's the evolution of telehealth, how far it's come, where we are today with this. All right. And so Dr. Boster, you're going to speak for 30, 35 minutes. Take it away, and I will come back on when I when I hear your cue. Okay, thank That's you. That's fantastic, Stuart. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I, I must be honest. This is my favorite MS Visa News program. Um, Neuro TV is an awesome opportunity to interact with your community, and I love this global online MS community. So thank you very much for having me back tonight. We're going to be talking about something that is, fortunately or unfortunately, very very germane to all of our lives and that's the advent of telehealth or telemedicine. I'm going to share my experiences from my vantage point as an MS neurologist here in Columbus, Ohio, and walk you through uh, my evolution of telehealth, uh, our adoption. I'm going to share with you a lot about what we're doing currently at our center, and I'm going to share a little bit about where I think the world is headed in the near term as it relates to telemedicine and telehealth. Then I'm going to wrap up by reminding everyone about the importance of being five for five in your fight against MS. So, so for starters, let me just thank everyone on the line for learning about MS with me. My name is Aaron Boster. I'm an MS neurologist in sunny Columbus, Ohio. I'm joking. It's not all that sunny here. And I uh, have wanted to be an MS doc since I was uh, 12, since before I was a teenager. And it wasn't because my uncle Mark had had MS. He'd had MS since my earliest memory. Um, I remember. Um, promising my mother that I would learn to take care of people like my uncle better than the men that were taking care of him. And I've had a very, very directed course. I have had a mission of helping people and families impacted by MS live their very best lives despite having the condition. And that has set me on, on quite a path. Most recently, it led to me opening up a standalone uh, private MS center called the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. And it was really uh, an opus of love. Uh, when, I, when I told folks that I was gonna start an MS center in 2020, they said, people don't do that. Docs don't do that anymore. Okay, so we did. We opened up a standalone 6,000 foot square foot gorgeous location on March 19th of 2020. That's the day we opened. And the governor of Ohio closed the state of Ohio on March 21st, 2020. So I was open for two days in a normal or pseudo normal environment where we had patients coming in the office and getting checked in and getting roomed in a room. And then I walked in the room and I saw them and I did examination stuff and delivered care. And two days later, that got squished um, when the governor closed the state of Ohio. And I looked at my CFO and we said, I guess we're doing telehealth. And in that moment, we flipped the switch and started to do something that we had never ever done before. Now, if we back up a little bit, what was my experience as an MS neurologist or as a doctor doing telemedicine? Prior to COVID, I did telemedicine twice against my will. See, a while back when I was working in a large neurology group, they talked me into, or actually they forced me to take stroke call at night, something that I don't like doing. Um, and I was forced against my will to take stroke call. And when there was an acute stroke in the hospital, I had to get on a camera and the other end of the camera would be in the emergency department where someone would be in a gurneyed bed with a nurse. And then I would direct a neurological examination across telemedicine. And then I would determine whether or not they needed a lytic like TPA to bust open a clot. 
And I thought that was the worst experience. I hated it. I was nervous about it. I was worried that I would make mistakes. I didn't enjoy the interaction. Um, and, and I decided that telehealth stunk. And I certainly never wanted to do it as a neurologist. That was my experience twice on telemedicine prior to COVID-19. Now, obviously, that changed. So March 19th of 2020, when um, we opened and two days later, the governor closed the state and we looked at each other and said, well, I guess we're doing telehealth. Except we didn't know what telehealth was. And so we started to Google and we looked up a couple different computer programs that would allow you to do a virtual chat. And the next day we started calling patients and saying, can't come in the office. We're gonna call you and we're gonna do a telehealth. And we were doing FaceTime, we were doing Doximity, we were using a little bit of the Zoom platform. We were trying out different things and it was quite the wild west. I called my biller and I said, hey, how do I bill telehealth? And he said, welcome to the wild west. And I said, what does that mean? He says, Aaron, there are no rules. Nobody's looking, do whatever you want. I said, well, what do I need to document? He said, honestly, nobody's looking. Go ahead and just do whatever you want. And in fact, the emergency laws that were put into place allowed doctors with an, a license in one state to see patients via telehealth outside of their own state. We were suddenly for the first time ever legally allowed to see a patient for the first time as a new consult on telemedicine. Previous to that, we were not allowed to do that. And in the great state of Ohio where I live, they even liberalized the medical marijuana registry so that I could enroll people into the MMJ Ohio registry online. They didn't even need to come in the office. So suddenly every option was available except we had no direction and we had to figure out what to do. And boy, it was really, really crazy. Now, very early on in this experience, I got together with Stuart Sloshman, uh, so the president of MS Visa News that's invited me here today. And he and I took a Saturday and we did a dummy telehealth run where he played patient, I played doctor, and we recorded the interaction. And it was on MS Visa News uh, YouTube channel. It was on my YouTube channel. And it was funny when I go back and look at that, because it was so new at the time. And quite literally, Stuart and I were demonstrating how you do it, like the logistics of doing a visit. And early on, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of adventure in trying to figure out what worked on telehealth and what didn't work on telehealth. And, and there's a tremendous amount of learning, learning uh, on my end. Um, I would submit to you that a year and some change later, I consider myself a telehealth expert and I've been doing 75% of all of my visits on telehealth even today, like today in clinic, 75% of the visits were remote. And there's been a tremendous, tremendous amount that we've learned. So what I would like to do is I would like to share with you a little bit about what we currently do with telehealth, like presently uh, at my office. And so when, when a patient is onboarding to our center, what we're trying to do these days, the very first visit is an hour consultation, and I prefer that to be on telemedicine. So even if you live in Columbus, Ohio, that first visit we do for an hour on telemedicine. Now, prior to the visit, you mail me your MRIs and you mail me all of your old clinic notes, all your lab re results, everything. I also have the patient complete a patient uh, summary of their, of their history, like with what I call a disease timeline. So that gets mailed to me prior to the visit. And I look at everything. I look at all the MRIs. I look at all the reports. I look at all the labs. And, and that gets me ready to do my best job when we meet on camera. Then we meet for an hour. And presently, we use Zoom. We have a special medical version of Zoom, so it's HIPAA compliant. Um, and we pay a monthly fee for that, and it's worth it because it's a really, really good platform. Um, it's my favorite platform. I say that having used a bunch, a bunch of different ones over the last year. And so we send the Zoom link via text message and via email to our patient. And so they can click the link and they can open up the Zoom. And typically it takes us a minute or two of fussing around with the microphones and the cameras until they can see me and I can see them. And then I do an hour consult where we spend a good amount of time talking through the history of what happened that ultimately led them coming to see me. And so we talk through all those details. Now, in a clinic visit, I normally would do a pretty comprehensive neuro exam, but in this modern world, I do not do a neuro exam that first hour. Wait for it. 
And then after we've gone through a detailed history, then we look at MRIs. Now, it turns out I love looking at MRIs on camera. It works awesome. See, I use an iPad and then I have my screen and I can take the iPad and turn it around so the iPad is pointed at my screen and then I can show you your MRI. You see what I see. And so we go through all the MRIs. Now, at the end of that, that's about 45 minutes of time. Then we delve out homework. Invariably, there's going to be some things that I need to think about and look up. And invariably, there's some things that the patient will need to collect. For example, please uh, collect the CSF results and mail them to me or what have you. I also use that inflection point after that first hour to give homework assignments like write down five life goals, write down your realistic exercise program, write down your top four symptoms, things like that. And then the second visit, if the patient lives in Ohio or in a neighboring state and they're willing to drive and they're vaccinated with a vaccine card, then we do that in the office for a second hour, typically like a week later. Now, if you live in the other side of the country, we'll do that second hour on telemedicine because it's not safe for people to travel. And that two one hour blocks is the way that I've been doing telemedicine new consults. During the second hour, if you're in the office, I can do a full exam. If, if we're doing a telemedicine, then uh, it's limited in what I can pull off for that consultation. Now, once you've established care at the Boster Center, um, we're gonna see you a minimum of twice a year at two visits, which ideally are in the office. Again, many people aren't yet vaccinated and many people are not yet safe to travel. And so that's not yet happening with consistency, but we're trying. All the other visits, aside from those tethered visits, I try to do virtually. So when you're in the office, we're gonna do the nine whole peg test, the time to 25 for walk, the simple digit modality, the low contrast visual acuity. We're gonna do a full neuro exam. On camera, we, we don't do that stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you a little bit that we can do, but that's a really big difference between what happens remotely and what happens in the office. And I, I will share with you, much to my surprise, that there is a tremendous amount that we can get done on camera. I feel like I've provided, in some cases, better care because of virtual medicine. And then there are some other situations where uh, it lives a little bit to be desired. Now, I've described to you what happens during a consult, but I also wanna share with you what happens during a standard follow-up visit. So if we're gonna do a telemedicine follow-up visit, first, we send you through our electronic medical record, the patient portal, we send you patient reported outcome measures. And there's a lot of them. They take about 11 minutes to complete, and they give us tremendous insight into what's going on with your MS over the last two weeks, the bowel, the bladder, the sexual function, the energy levels, the mood, the anxiety, the depression, the numbness, the balance, the falling. We go, the questions, you complete all of them and they're done prior to when we have our visit. And so when you sit down with me and we turn on our cameras and we connect, the first thing that I can do is I can read through your responses and they're validated measures that give me great insight into a, a cognitive score, a depression score, an anxiety score, a fatigue score. There's a tremendous amount that I can learn just by looking at that before we even start talking. And then on camera, we game out how to win. We look at MRIs when you have MRIs. We discuss symptoms when you have symptoms. We can start MS medicines. We can change or switch MS medicines and we can start and manage chronic symptoms. It is a very surreal experience to meet a person with MS, order MRIs, review the MRIs, order labs, review the labs, do the best we can trying to examine from a distance, diagnose them with MS, start them on a disease modifying therapy and monitor the therapy never having shook their hand. And yet that is exactly what we've been doing with some people via telemedicine because they live in another state or they're not safe to travel. And so we've been making the best of it. Now, I would like to share with you, in my opinion, the pros and the cons of telemedicine. Certain things that in my mind stand out as being outstanding and certain things that stand out as being a little lackluster. Delicious apple juice. So if I make a list of the pros, the things that I think are really super, some of them we've already touched on. Number one, we are no longer limited by geography. So if you are in Jakarta, Indonesia, I can see you. 
You can be in Melbourne, Australia, and I can see you, and I have. You can be in California, or in Florida, or in Michigan, or in Ohio, and it doesn't matter, because with the present um, liberalization of the laws, we can conduct telemedicine across state lines. And, and that's been really awesome, because there are places around the world where there aren't great access to MS care. And some of those people, they can't simply drive six, seven, eight hours to the closest MS center. And so telemedicine removes boundaries, which is really, really awesome. And I wanna come back to the future of telemedicine as it relates to those boundaries in a couple minutes. The second thing that I really like about telemedicine is it's wicked fast. So if, if you're having an issue, let's say that God forbid you wake up and you can't see, I can be on camera with you later that day. And it doesn't matter if you um, are live far away from me or if you're close to me or if you've got a really busy day, as long as you have a cell phone or an iPad or a laptop and you have a half an hour, we can jump on camera and we can conduct a visit and we can sort out what's going on. And so the flexibility is awesome. The lack of distance being a barrier is awesome, but also the quickness that we can turn around a visit, I think is a perk. Now, another thing that I really, really like about telemedicine is our ability to do tight follow-up care. So if you are coming in to see me in the office, oftentimes you have to take like a half day off work. So you have to get maybe some FMLA or maybe use some PTO or maybe just beg and borrow and ask. But the point is you gotta miss work and that's an issue. And if I said, well, why don't we get back together in a month to see how you're doing? You may say, Dr. B, I, I don't have unlimited PTO. I can't just take time off every single time that we want to talk about something. And, and that's a barrier. But with telemedicine, it's not because very often we can see you in quick follow up. I'll give you an example. So if somebody is having really bad spasms at night, which are waking them from sleep, that's terrible. And I want to treat that. So maybe I'll prescribe them um, a two-part plan. Number one, stretch before bed. So I want them to really stretch out uh, before they get in bed. And then number two, I want them to take a medicine called Tizanidine or Xanaflex. Now, Xanaflex is a, a central acting muscle relaxant, and it's a pill that has side effects, including significant sedation and some other things. And so in the telemedicine world, what I will typically do is I will prescribe them Xanaflex and a stretching regimen, and then I'll say, why don't we touch bases in three to four weeks to see how it's going? And then we get back together in three to four weeks specifically to talk about that. And it doesn't take much time. You don't have to travel to my office. I don't spend a tremendous amount of time, but it allows us a touch point where I can make sure that you're tolerating it, that it's going okay and that it's working. And if not, we can make a change. Now, maybe one of the ways that I think this is most notable, where I really, really appreciated this value the very most, relates to psychiatry. So as you're very well aware, there's a global viral pandemic. And as you're probably aware, at the same time, there is a global mental health crisis right now. The entire globe is going through this mental health crisis where most of the tools that we were given to manage stress and anxiety in life were ripped away from us. And we were kept indoors with our entire family 24 seven. And a lot of us are going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and it's been really tough. Now, jokes aside, I have never treated more depression or anxiety or other, uh, other issues like irritability, uh, agoraphobia. I, I've never done more work in this area than I have in this past year and a half. And it's, it's for a good reason. It's because we're all struggling with something which is so challenging, we don't even have language to describe it. And I've dealt with a lot of my MS patients, many of them who don't live in Ohio, who are really, really depressed. Some of them have been so depressed, they've thought about hurting themselves. Um, we're talking real serious stuff here. And so what I have found to be helpful is as I deliver telemedicine psychiatric care, I can see them frequently. And there's been some families where I've seen them monthly for seven months in a row, or I've seen someone weekly for an entire month. And that's something which would not be available to us if it wasn't for the benefits of telemedicine. And so I view that as a really good thing. Now, there's other things about telemedicine that work really well. For example, if we need to get an MRI, you don't have to come in the center. 
I can send you to the MRI suite where you can have the MRI done, and then you can go home. The scans are electronically sent to me. We jump on camera, and like I described before, we can go through all of your scans. And I would submit to you that it may be in a better interaction because it's laser focused. All that you see on the screen is your MRI, and you and your family can watch it, and I can watch it. Another really, really cool benefit to telemedicine, in my opinion, is dealing with families from different locations. And so oftentimes when someone comes to a visit in, in clinic in the office, they'll come by themselves or they may bring a loved one. But if we're doing telemedicine and your sister in another state wants to listen in, we give her the Zoom link and she jumps on at the same time. And I'm gonna date myself, but it makes me think of the Brady Bunch where you have a bunch of little screens and all the different people are there and we're all interacting and talking. And I've had visits where the patient and his wife are on one screen and the mother and father who are in a different home in the same city are on a different screen. And the sister has dialed in from another state and then I'm on camera. So there's four boxes, six people, and we're all talking and interacting. And it's really an awesome group uh, discussion about gaming out the very best way to beat MS. And we're doing it virtually. And so I think that's really cool. Another really, really cool thing about telemedicine is something that in neurology or in medicine we call the social history. So what is the social history? The social history is learning about you and your environment, where you live, what you do, what kind of hobbies you have, what do you like to drink, what do you do for living, those kind of things. And traditionally, when we do a social history, we ask if they work and whether or not they smoke. And we may ask more questions, but we're not getting very deep into understanding the human. That was flipped on its head when I started to log on camera and there I see my patient in their own environment. And seeing you in your own environment has been colossal to me. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. There's a lovely patient that I take care of who is a pianist and she makes a living by teaching children piano. And she comes into the office and has for over a decade. Um, and here we are in telemedicine. And so we're, we're on telemedicine last March or April, and we're talking, and I'm trying to do a couple exam things. I said, do some of this for me, all right? Do, do some of that. And then I said, wait a second, where's your piano? And she got a big grin on her face, and she said, it's in the other room. Would you like to see it? And I said, yeah. So she picked up her laptop, and she brought it into her piano room, and she showed me a gorgeous baby grand piano. It was all black. It was absolutely to die for. And I asked her, would you play for me? And the smile was from ear to ear. She said, yes, I would love to. And she sits down and guys, she transformed into a different person. This is a woman that I feel I've known for a long time. And I was brought to tears with her playing the piano. It was unbelievable. So not only did I get to test her coordination, which by the way was insanely good, not only did I get to see something that she was proud of and a part of her life, but I got to hear my patient play music. And boy, that was really special to me. I'll give you another example about a guy who I think is a really cool guy. He's a very quiet dude. He's very, very uh, stoic. He doesn't say a lot. And so when, you, when I meet with him, I normally have to really ask questions to try to understand what's going on. And I see him on telemedicine and we turn the camera on and he's sitting in a lazy boy recliner and he's got a bright yellow room, like almost like a, a yellow highlighter, like bright neon yellow room. And on every wall that I can see are framed concert posters. And it was the neatest thing. And I said, what are we looking at? And he says, these are all the concerts that I've been to. And I asked him to give me a tour of his, of his room. This was his music room. And in one corner were all his guitars. I didn't know he played the guitar and all of the concerts were there and it was it was absolutely colossal so so when we talk about understanding a human being we appreciate the fact that the clinic is a fake environment that's not a real environment it's it's an it's an artificial construct seeing you in your own home is worth its weight in gold it's really been a very very fantastic experience for me now there are limitations to telemedicine and I, I wouldn't be doing the best job if we didn't review what those limitations are. And one limitation is connectivity. And so as you think about the universe and earth and the world, some areas have better Wi-Fi than others. 
And it's really, really frustrating when we have a telemedicine visit and you're on camera and I'm on camera and you're trying to talk to me and it sounds like you're a robot. <laughs> and I'm desperately trying to listen and you're desperately trying to talk, but the connectivity is bad. And fortunately, it doesn't happen all the time, but I would say that once a day to once every two days, we have to abort a telemedicine visit because we're not successful in connecting. And my team has a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Plan D is just to call you on the phone. But the point is, is that's a limitation. And it's a real bummer when that doesn't work out. Another limitation of telemedicine is neurological examinations. So I'm a classically trained uh, MS neurologist, and I take great pride in my ability to do neurological testing. And when you come to the clinic, as I mentioned, we do the nine-hole peg test, where you move the pegs really fast, and we time it. We do the timed 25 foot walk when you scream down the hall as fast as you can walk. We do a symbol digit modality, which is a cog test. And we do a low and a high contrast visual acuity, so an eye test. And then when you're in the clinic, we oftentimes do a neuro exam, you know, like where you touch the nose and the finger and then you track the thing, all that kind of stuff. And on telemedicine, it's hard to do that. Some of it can be done. I've even made YouTube videos on my channel about how you could do it but it's very limiting, it's, it's, it's hard to pull off. And so I, I just wanna call out that doing a neuro exam on camera is limited. And I do wanna share with you where I think the future is going, and I'm gonna also talk about the future of neurological testing on camera. So given that we're kind of um, close to the end of my, my spiel by uh, 35 minutes, I wanna share with you two last thoughts. One is on the future of telemedicine and where I think it's going. And then last is uh, five things that I really, really want every single person on this call to be doing. So what's the future of telemedicine? First of all, the chronic illness community, people with lupus, people with MS, people with diabetes, people with cancers, people who have chronic conditions have been demanding telemedicine forever. And the world didn't listen until there was a global viral pandemic and a bunch of really healthy people suddenly needed access to healthcare. And what we have discovered is that it works. And I think that it would be a travesty to remove it. I also think that enough people have found value in it that I don't think that it's gonna be easy to summarily just remove it. Like we don't do that anymore. So I do think that telemedicine is here to stay in some capacity. Now, the American government has currently allowed these emergency laws that allow doctors to see patients for the first time on, on camera so they can do a consult, which before we weren't allowed, and to see people across state lines, which we weren't allowed. And I'm very curious about what the government will do. If I was guessing, I would guess they're not going to reverse it all the way back, but they'll probably put some stipulations in. Now, interestingly, there's a new type of medical license, which is just rolling out. It's not out in the state of Ohio yet, but I can't wait to get it when it is. It's called an intra-state license. And if you have an intra-state license, then every other state that has an intra-state license honors yours. And so I am very, very eager to get an intra-state license. Supposedly it doesn't roll out in Ohio until September of 2022. And why do I want that? Because I think that's a way that I can continue to provide telemedicine care to all of my patients in Florida and California in Texas and et cetera. And so I think that's gonna be a thing. Now, I, I think in order to make telemedicine um, viable in the future, we have to solidify the payment because presently CMS pays doctors the same that they pay for an in-office visit. And I think it's likely to not stay that way, but it's my hope that reimbursement is adequate, that docs can make ends meet so that we can continue to offer this service. Now, one of the things that must improve if we are to adopt telemedicine long-term, so not in an emergency, just long-term, is we must come up with a way to accurately monitor patients, examine patients. And I wanna share with you a couple of uh, things that we're doing and beta testing at the Boston Center for MS and where I see the field maybe going. So one thing that we can do is we can do a timed 25 foot walk at your house. All you need is 25 feet mapped off on the floor, which you can do with the tape measure. And you need a family member with a stopwatch. And if you don't have a family member with a stopwatch, technically I could do it while I watch you on camera. And you would put your feet at the starting gates and then you would walk as fast as you can safely without running 
25 feet down the hall. And we would click the button when you started and the button when you passed the threshold, and then we would measure that. And that is the single most valuable physical exam feature for measuring progression in an ambulatory patient is, is a timed 25 foot walk. Now, another thing that you could do is you could mail a human being a nine hole peg test. So, you know, the pegboard with the nine pegs that you move. And we've even made a couple out of, out of uh, cardboard. And so theoretically, we could send those to our patients and then we could monitor them doing nine hole peg tests. Um, and, and so you could create analog testing and that is a way to do things. There's another way and that's to leverage technology. Now, our center, the Boster Center, is currently beta testing a product called Floodlight MS. So Floodlight MS is an app. It's made by an MS manufacturer, but it has nothing to do with their products. And it's intended to measure patients between visits, which sounds really relevant in telemedicine land. And so our center is beta testing using this with clinic patients. And you download an app, and then you put in my clinic code, which links your app to my clinic. And then each time you do the testing that I'm about to describe, it gets uploaded into my clinic where I can see the results. And then when you log on for your telemedicine visit, even though you're in California and I'm in Columbus, we can look at all your results together. What is it measuring? It's measuring upper extremity function and dexterity. Um, so it's not doing a nine hole peg test. You're squishing tomatoes and you're tracing shapes, which gets it the exact same information. If there isn't a time 25 foot walk, but there is a walking test where you put, um, you, you put the iPhone or the, or the Samsung in your pocket and you walk and when it beeps, you do a quick turn. There's also a six minute walk test where it just has you walk as far as you can for that period of time. Very, very accurate testing. There's a cog test. There's a cognition test, like a matching test, just like we do in the clinic. And so my point here is we're starting to come up with some ways of creatively monitoring patients from a distance. And I really think that has a lot to do with the future. One more future element that I think will become uh, useful with telemedicine is group visits. So conducting a group visit. As I mentioned to you before, I've had plenty of times when I had multiple family members on the same screen. And I, in my own clinical practice, live in the office, have done group visits before where we see multiple patients at one time. And you could combine those two concepts and you could do a group visit for a specific symptom. For example, you could have 10 gentlemen that all have issues with erectile function all log on and we would do a focused telemedicine group visit managing erectile dysfunction. We would address each concern and probably mail out some scripts of Viagra afterwards and put them in the mail. And so this is a viable thing that we could definitely do. So this has been an adventure for me. It's been an adventure for my office teammates. It's also been an adventure for the patients that have been putting up with these, this rapidly changing world, going from only being in the office to doing 75% of what we do via telemedicine. I would say that by and large, I'm grateful that we've had the opportunity because I think that we've been able to maintain care. And I think that means a lot. And I definitely think that there's some really good things that have come out of telemedicine. I think it's here to stay and I hope to help shape it. Now, before we turn the lines back over to Stuart and answer your questions, I did wanna share with you what it means to be five for five in your fight against MS. Because independent of whether I'm seeing you in the office or whether I'm seeing you on camera, or even if I don't get to see you, but we get to interact on social media or on YouTube, I want you to be five for five in your fight against MS. So what does that mean? There are five things that I'm aware of that, that make MS slow down and improve the quality of your life. And so I want you to do all five. Number one is don't smoke stuff. Smoking stuff speeds up MS by about 50%. And if you don't have MS, smoking stuff doubles the risk to develop MS. And so I don't want you to smoke stuff, whether that be tobacco or wacky tobacco. Number two, and being five for five in your fight against MS, is to supplement low levels of vitamin D. So low levels of vitamin D increase the risk to develop MS. And if you have MS, Low levels of vitamin D drive the disease faster. And so supplementing levels to drive it above 50 but below 100 is really a good idea. Now we can expand the second item to include diet, but that's kind of outside the context of this lecture. Now number three and being five for five 
is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. And I don't want you to become the next MMA champion or a uh, professional mountain climber. I am looking for you to participate in an exercise activity on a regular basis. And I want you to find an activity that you don't hate because I'm looking for presenteeism. And so if you can go for a brisk walk early in the morning before the sun comes up, rock it. If you can do tantric sex or yoga, God bless. If you really like playing handball or lifting weights, I don't care what it is that you're doing, but it needs to become part of your lifestyle. People who exercise with MS end up less disabled at the end of their life. They have better cognitive function. They have less depression and they have more energy. It protects them against balance problems and weakness. And it's really, really good stuff. Now, number four in being five for five is to take an MS medicine and make sure it's working. And in fact, I want you to take the most effective medicine that you're comfortable taking. And the way that we make sure it's working, we get MRIs to make sure there are no new spots. We examine you or do clinical testing to make sure that your exam's not worsening functionally. And most important, we listen to what you have to say because you're a U expert to make sure that you're not having attacks or failing the litmus test of life. That's number four. And number five, and being five for five in your fight against MS, is to take a moment each and every single day to practice mindfulness or centering yourself. Mindfulness is defined as being in the present moment without prejudice or judgment and really existing in the now. So for example, every morning I take a shower, so you're welcome. And in the shower, I do shower meditation where I sit in the shower and I close my eyes and I practice breathing. And it's been a real game changer for me. My name's Aaron Boster, and as always, I wanna thank you for learning about MS with me. Thank you for letting me share with you the adventure of telemedicine during this global viral pandemic. And let's remember that it's important to be five for five in your fight against MS. And with that, I'd love to invite Stuart from MS News and News back on the line to take your questions. Awesome. I love hearing you speak because I do not know how anybody could have any questions after they hear you speak, right? Pretty awesome. But still, we have a way of doing it. And by the way, when I get in the shower in the morning, it's a lot of exercise just remaining standing. So, you know, it's good. It's good balance, right? Yep. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, there was a joke that was passed around recently about uh, people having to get into their underwear in the morning and how staying upright and not falling over. So, you know, you learn to stay balanced if you could just get into your underwear without holding on to anything. There. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. So we do have a lot of questions. We do have a lot of people online. I do want to say that Dr. Boster will be ending this by 8.15 Eastern time tonight. So um, please know that when you see it get around to eight o'clock, if you have any questions, make sure you type them in online. If you don't know how to do that, please go to the top of the scroll bar, see the uh, orange rectangular box. There's an arrow in it, click on that, type your question, um, try to keep it limited and only relevant to our topics, okay? Um, yes, we are talking about multiple sclerosis, we're talking about telehealth, and um, you know, Dr. Boster did mention about when he and I got online and we did a telehealth call, and it was really awesome because he had to look into my eye, all right, and he asked me to open up my mouth and look at my mouth, and I had to do all these weird things that I just didn't expect to have to do, And but I did learn about this telehealth call as well, and like Dr. Boster mentioned, it is on his YouTube channel, it is on our YouTube channel, and you can find it and learn from it, okay? Thank you very much, Doc. All right, first question about telehealth is, what do you do with a person that's extremely shy to begin with, and then you put them on this call and they, they're uncomfortable with using the internet as it is? How do you get them to open up and express themselves as to what's going on? I think that there's a couple things that we can do in preparation. So, so, you know, medicine is intimate and they need to make sure that they're in a location where the other people can't overhear them. So I've done a lot of telemedicine in, in cars because everyone's trapped at home with their family. So they go in their garage or they go in their car and they close the door. So that actually, I think is, is one thing that you want to be planful about. The second thing is, I think that we have to recognize that it's weird. Like it's weird to talk via telemedicine and it's okay to say that. Say, so this is really strange. You know, I, I really prefer to see in person, but I'm, and, and so I like to break the ice, if you will, by kind of commenting on what they're, where they are. Um, as I mentioned to you, I love seeing people's homes, 
and I love seeing people's outsides. And honestly, a lot of my patients will take me outside and show me their backyard because that's awesome. Like it's really, really cool to see where people live. So we may start the call just by kibitzing a little bit like that. And then I like to start the call by saying, what's on top of mind for you? Because you're starting with some thoughts. So I like to get those out on the table. And by the time you finish sharing what's on the table, I think most often people are feeling the love and they're a bit comfortable. And you can kind of lose yourself in the discussion. And that's what we're going for. Sure. Thank you very much. And by the way, for anybody that did not understand kibitzing, it means talking. All right. Okay. New language. All right. Next person, a person named Cindy is writing, um, if one of your out-of-state patients had a relapse and winds up in the hospital where no doctor knows anything about multiple sclerosis, would you consider speaking with both patients and a knowledgeable hospitalist via televisit to try to help? All the time. So, so when my patient is admitted in the hospital, whether they live in Columbus, Ohio, or whether they live in upstate New York, I want to be involved in their care. And every single one of my patients has my cell phone for a reason. And I like it when their spouse has the cell phone also, because when they're in the hospital and the, the hospitalist rounds, they can call and say, talk to my neurologist and just hand them the phone. And so it's been my experience that oftentimes inpatient doctors are very, very happy to talk to me because MS is not something they do on a daily basis. And so very often they're more than happy to have a conversation with me because I can provide some insights into what's going on. I'll share with you that unfortunately, many people have been hospitalized or had attacks in this past year. And fortunately, we've done a very good job with telemedicine. We've made it work. That's right, thank you for that. All right, so moving on to something else. And by the way, if anybody has any questions about multiple sclerosis in general, I mean, you could ask these questions as well, as long as we have time to ask them. Dr. Bosser has already agreed that he will take this on as well. All right, going back to what you were saying about psychology and um, you know what you're doing with some of your calls with that um, are you offering the patients to do psychic psych assessments so so one of the biggest uh, troubles that I've had is trying to get someone in front of a psychiatrist and we have found um, a psychiatric nurse practitioner group um, in Ohio that will see patients on telemedicine but they'll only see them a couple times. So it's not a foolproof plan. Um, if we need to get neuropsychometric testing, then we send them to, a, to neuropsych testing, but that's done in a hospital, unfortunately. Right. Now, COG testing, we can do remotely. Um, if I send them a questionnaire, they can fill it out. Or screening tools to measure cognition, we can do remotely. Um, and so there is some of that that we can do. I routinely, Stuart, have people fill out a, a, a PHQ-9, which is a, a depression score, and a FSS, which is a fatigue severity scale. So almost every patient is completing those two measures. I also have patients fill out other things like pain scales and stuff. So psychiatric right. there is a lot that we can learn just from patient reported outcome measures. Right. So I know that psychologist, Dr. Rick Harris, that you've met uh, mm -hmm. doing our programs, I know he's given out um, psych exams for you know the psych assessments based on depression and mental wellness mental wellness excuse me um with regard to like the form bad 22 yeah. I mean, one one whatever it is so um i know that's very complex i know it's you know work i've seen what he's what he sends out to people and i i've heard from a lot of patients that it's very useful for them to you know get that information into the doctor first. I didn't know if you're working with something like that. Not that, um, not that advanced, but, but even, you know, the, the PHQ-9 is nine questions and it very accurately measures depression. Okay. Um, so when I gave an example of treating someone where I saw them monthly on camera, we followed the PHQ-9. And as I watched the PHQ-9 improve, I watched them improve. Right. Okay, thank you for that. Let's talk about your PEG test. Everybody wants to know what this nine hole PEG test is. I mean, you've mentioned it a few times, but you haven't actually explained what it's about. So if I had an example, I'd pull it out. So imagine with me a board and it's got two halves. And on one half, it has nine holes drilled in it. And on the other half, it has a little tray with nine pegs. 
And so the nine hole peg test is a validated tool to measure upper extremity function. And you set it in front of you and you got a stopwatch. And when you hit the stopwatch, you grab a peg and you put it in a hole. And you put each of the nine pegs in a hole and then you take each peg out. And when you remove the last peg, we hit the stopwatch again. And a healthy control can do this in about 15 seconds. And we do two tries with the left hand and two tries with the right hand. Now, this is done routinely in every MS clinical trial, and we do it with, with our visits at our center at least twice a year. A 20% decline in the speed is statistically significant. So if you did it in 10 seconds, and now you're doing it in 17 seconds, something's wrong. I may not know what yet, but I know where. I know that there's something wrong with your upper extremity, and then it allows me to be layers or focus to kind of work on it. That's the nine hole peg test. Great, thank you for that. All right, Tamina from Canada, Montreal. She's writing, hi doctor, is it possible to consult you for a second opinion through telemedicine? I'm based in Montreal, Canada, and I've had a hard time finding a neuro that takes new patients even for a second opinion. Montreal is my favorite city in North America, and I wish that it was only okay to do it where I travel to you. Cela sera génial parce que cette ville-là, c'est super, j'adore, carrément. But we don't have to travel like that. Instead, we can do telemedicine. Um, and I have done several telemedicine visits um, from other states. Um, you call the center, and we set it up, and we do a two-hour consultation. It is possible. Did you just tell her that you want her to come see her? I told her that I love Montreal very much parce que c'est okay. génial comme there you go. Okay. For all those that didn't understand like me, tell me in Spanish, I'll be able to repeat it. Okay. All right. Could, Katerina is asking, how do you diagnose a patient with optic neuritis on telemed? So it's going to be really hard to do a, a new optic neuritis diagnosis on telemedicine. That's going to be difficult. Now, as Stuart shared earlier, I can actually examine your pupils. Like it, it does work. I've done it where you get really, really close to the camera and I have you hold a light, and I have you shine a light in one eye, and then I have you shine a light in the other eye, and I can see what your pupils do. And so I can tell you whether you have one of the common trappings of um, optic neuritis, which is called an APD or an afferent pupillary defect. I also can elicit a history of pain with eye movement and decreased vision. But to your point, I'm going to want confirmation ideally from an ophthalmologist, and if you live in, in, let's say, Lubbock, Texas, and I'm in Columbus, Ohio, I'm going to send you to a local optometrist or a local ophthalmologist who's going to, who's going to send me their correspondence. If you're in Columbus and you can travel to my office, I can do the testing in my office. But you're right that there are certain things where we might see that we think there's a problem and then we need to follow it up with a real live human being. Right. Got it. Thank you. All right. So if you... Um if you're working with a patient on telehealth and they don't live in your area or they don't even live in your state, can you um, order an MRI and, and are they allowed to take your prescription that you have from there and use it wherever it is? So it's, it's, a, it's a very weird world that we live in right now, Stuart. So pre-COVID, no, not really. I mean, sometimes, but, but oftentimes they would say no. Post-COVID, People appreciate that we're trying to make the best of it. And a lot of times my order is accepted. So I can mail an order to Virginia and then in Virginia, they'll honor it. Now, if they don't, what we do is we go to the primary care doctor with my written order and the PCP copies it and then turns it in if the PCP is willing to work with us. So one way or the other, um, it does work. And we have been able to get MRIs in other states. And then they send me a disc either electronically or on a CD-ROM. And then we can look at it together. Right. So that's my next question. How do you work with the patient or how does the patient relate to what you have now? You have the, you have the information in a CD-ROM. How do you show the differences that they might have? Um, hopefully not worse, but if they were, can you show the differences on one MRI to another MRI via telehealth? So that's a really good point. So one of the stipulations when a patient mails me a follow-up MRI CD is they have to ask the, the MRI suite to put the old and the new scan on the same disc. So if you give me last year's scan on one disc and this year's scan on another disc, I got a problem because I only have one computer and one terminal. And even if I had two computers and two screens, that's not an appropriate way of assessing two scans. 
what we really want to do is we want both both studies on the same MRI disc. We throw that in the scanner. I have special software and I literally pull up the old and the new scan side by side and you and I review it together. And it works really, really well. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, do you have a maximum age that you take? Yes. So I refuse to see patients over 130. So if you're 129 when I establish care with you, fine. But as soon as you turn 130, I discharge you from my practice because I'm ageist and I refuse to see people that are over 130. Great. Right. Thank you for that. There are a lot of questions that people have about age related. Um, firstly, I want everybody to know that we are doing an age and an aging with MS program tomorrow night. We have nurse Sherry Benz, who's also got multiple sclerosis, speaking with me tomorrow night about aging with MS. I mean, awesome. what, you know, you know what, what can we speak about? And by the way, for anybody on here that doesn't know me, yes, I too have MS. All right. It's not that I'm just up here looking good and, and working with Dr. Boster. OK. All <laughs> right. So, so, yeah, there's a lot of age related questions and a lot of them are re related around the different medications. People want to know why their doctors are telling them at 60 or 65, it's time to get off your med and why, you know, and should they or shouldn't they? So, so I'm very biased. So, so please, if you're listening to me, know that I'm not objective. I'm very, very biased about this topic. Okay. So you're not getting an objective opinion. You're getting a very, very subjective opinion from a doctor who thinks it's a travesty to practice ageism in my field. I think it's repulsive to stop someone's medicine because they happen to have a birthday. Now, I do not agree with stopping a medicine because you've reached a certain age. I do appreciate that as you age, particularly as you reach your seventh and eighth decade of life, your immune system becomes quieter. And I do agree that we could de-escalate from a highly effective therapy with maybe a side effect profile that's not awesome, excuse me, to something that's a little bit more palatable. I think that's fair and I do that but I don't think we should stop medicines. Why do doctors stop medicines and people in their certain age? The, the real answer is I don't know because it makes no sense to me. And the, the data is not there to support doing that. I think maybe it's a twisted misunderstanding of paternalism where they think they're doing the best thing for you. But the reason I get upset about it is Stuart, I've seen so many people that are taken off their medicine and then they worsen and they come see me and we put them back on their medicine. Um, one gal is in her mid fifties, which is young by any stretch of the imagination. All right, so she's like 56 or something like that. And her neurologist said, you don't need to be on medicine anymore and stopped her medicine. And a year later, she picked up a new thing that she had never done before. It's called using a cane. And she came and saw me and she's devastated and we've got her back on a medicine and she's not going to lose the cane, I'm afraid. So I, I really, I really don't understand why a doctor would want to do that to a family. And I personally don't think it's the right decision, but I'm also very biased. So just keep that in mind. Exactly. Thank you. Going back to the vitamin D, instead of piece, a person just downing whatever uh, dosage they want of vitamin D, shouldn't they first see or get, um, um, Tested to see what level they actually need? I think that if you're going to take a vitamin D supplementation, you want to do it with a target. You don't just want to airy fairy take vitamin D. And you want the goal of the vitamin D level, and it's a vitamin D 25 OH, that's the lab, to be above 50 but below 100. So you want it between 50 and 100. And to your point, I don't want to just start giving you vitamin D. I want to check your level so I know where it is. And then I want to give you vitamin D and then I want to recheck your level to make sure I got there. And so we check vitamin D levels in our patients at least once a year so that we can make sure that the level is not too high and it's not too low. Thank you. Is that true with many of the other vitamins like B12 and B1 and, and this and that? You know, uh, there, there are so many different things that people are using for multiple sclerosis. Should they always be having their levels checked? I. I don't know that there's a large benefit to checking levels of other vitamins, although I also don't know that there's a benefit to taking very, very high doses of other vitamins. So I love when my patients take a multivitamin and I love when my patients take vitamin D, 
But other supplements, I think, are a discussion. I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm just saying we should discuss it. And if you're taking um, a B12 complex, I'm very unlikely to check your level on a routine basis. Um, but, but I think the question becomes when there's deficiencies, like if you're numb and I'm trying to figure it out, I should check a B12 level. So I do think there are certain circumstances where it's a good idea, but I don't do it routinely. Gotcha. All right. So thank you for that. Now, the next thing a uh, person wants to know, um, it, why don't all MS specialists use the PEG test? So I'm not sure why all specialists don't use the PEG test. It is one of the most sensitive upper extremity function tests that exist. And it takes 15 seconds on one hand and 15 seconds on the other. So it doesn't take very long. Um, I find it to be invaluable. Um, and I would switch the question around and say, why don't you ask your neurologist why they don't use a PEG test? Okay, thank you. Mary Lou writes, do you think that a meeting with a psychiatrist or psychologist should be included with an MS diagnosis, treating to help the patient try and navigate those feelings of sadness, mourning that can come with a diagnosis. So I think that whoever asked that question is a smart person and they identify that there's more to an MS diagnosis than learning about a new condition. There's the emotional aspects of grappling with a life-changing diagnosis. And I think being sensitive to that is very, very important. Now. Does every person need a psychologist? No. Would every person benefit? No. But is it a good idea? Yes. And do I think it would be valuable that um, an MS doctor has a liaison or a relationship with a counselor that they can refer to? Yes, I do. Because not every patient is gonna want or benefit from that, but I want to have it as an option. And I think that person is very wise to think about it. Right, thank you for that. All right, next, uh, again, this came up um, for our talk the other day. It's coming up again today, um, and it, obviously it's new people. They wanna know what the difference is of the talk about T cells and the talks about B cells, which medication is actually the one that they should be using. Is there a certain one? So I'm a MS neurologist, which almost by definition means I'm a big nerd. Like I really like the alphabet soup of the immune system and the B cells and the T cells and the NK cells and all these different cell types. And when I get together with my friends, my MS nerd friends, we, we discuss and argue and fight about the details of this stuff, right? It's very germane to what we do. The rubber meets the road, however, when we see how a human being does on a given therapy. And what I would say is this, if you like understanding stuff, like if it helps you to understand the mechanism of how the drug works, then I want you to understand it and I wanna explain it to you. But I don't think that understanding it is necessary to have a good benefit. And my point here is I'm gonna teach you as much as you want to know about your therapy. And it's important to me that you understand enough about it that you understand the risk profile and how it works but I do think that sometimes a non-medically savvy patient can get kind of lost and they can get so caught up in the, the alphabet soup and the numbers that they lose sight of what's really, really important, which is their life and their ability to conduct their life and whether or not MS is limiting them. So I love talking to patients about the B cells and the T cells and the innate immune system and all this stuff. I really do. But I think the rubber meets the road when we see how they're doing. And that's what I would like to focus on. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next, um, we have, um, you spoke about uh, all that exercise earlier, and uh, I wanted to know if you expected anybody to become a ninja warrior. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's awesome when a patient goes above and beyond, right? Um, and every once in a while, a patient will bring me a photograph having completed some amazing race, like a hundred mile bike race or a, or a marathon. But that is not the expectation. Now, I'll tell you a very quick story, Stuart. Years ago, I was doing a patient program and they brought in um, a patient advocate uh, who was gonna tell her story. And I kind of was not excited about it and I kind of slunk to the back of the room and, and she started talking. But what she said has stuck with me. This woman was a self-described couch potato like that's how she described herself. 
And when she was diagnosed with MS, she decided that she would run the Boston Marathon, having never run a race before. And she found her friend who, who was actually given a chronic diagnosis and they trained and they illegally jumped into the Boston Marathon. They didn't qualify, but it was in the news. And so they had TV crews that like watched her and she completed the Boston Marathon. And after the Boston Marathon, a group of guys came up to her and congratulated her and said, listen, we're planning to climb the seven highest peaks in the world. Would you join us? And she was like on a high and she's like, sure. Well, they weren't joking. She is now a professional mountain climber and she has climbed the seven highest peaks in the world. Now, her story was and her message was awesome because her message was not be, climb a mountain. Her message was your mountain might be walking to the end of the driveway, getting your your mail and walking back. That might be your mountain. But whatever your mountain is, climb it. And I thought that was such a powerful tool talking about exercise that it really just almost made me feel, you know, chills. And so each individual human has to decide. If you want to be a ninja warrior, God bless, be a ninja warrior. If you want to do water Zumba once a week, do water Zumba once a week. But no matter what, having an exercise as part of your lifestyle is key to living your best life despite having MS. Gotcha. Thank you. And yes, she is an incredible woman. So, um, yeah, we'll, we, you'll, you all will hear from her in a few months. I'm not going to say her name right now. All right. Uh, Stephanie is asking, I've had trouble with my tongue being tired while eating and tongue uh, fasciculation. Yeah, that word. Is this common with MS? So, so what she's saying is that her tongue is, is not as strong as it used to be. And in fact, part of it is quivering. So the tongue will like, the muscles will quiver and it doesn't work as well as it used to. And that's a real problem because we use our tongue to sing and talk and we use our tongue to eat and drink. And so if your tongue is messed up, it can really make it hard to do those things. Fortunately, there's an entire field dedicated to retraining your tongue. It's called speech pathology or speech therapy. And where I would start is working with a speech therapist and they will have you do exercises, pa, 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 ta, 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 ka, ka, ka. And they'll help you figure out how to retrain your mouth so that you can speak and swallow safely. So get ye to a speech pathologist and they will help you. Very good. Thank you. I remember when you did that pa, 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 ta, ta, ta with me on our telehealth call. Well, and, and actually, Stuart, just to talk about that for a quick second, when you say pa, 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 right, you're, you're moving your lips and that tests the, the seventh cranial nerve. So if I want to test the seventh cranial nerve, I can do it by making you say that sound. If you say ta, ta, so the people that are listening, everybody at your house say ta, 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 ta. What you're doing ta, ta. is you're taking your tongue and you're striking the roof of your mouth and you're making that T sound. So I can hear whether it sounds normal, because if I say, say, ta, 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 and you say, ga, 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 I can hear that there's something wrong. And that's the 12th cranial nerve. That's the, the nerve that runs the tongue. So by doing those sounds across telemedicine, we can learn about your nervous exam, which is really cool. Great. That's awesome. Thank you for that. All right. Next, um, we have a person says uh, that she's getting eye pains or he's getting eye pains that will lead to cluster headaches. Eye scans don't show very serious problems, but they've been told that, old, that it could be caused by old scarring. Has that anything to do with that? So, you know, the one thing I can say is, is pain, unfortunately, is common in MS. And we don't need to have a, a physical finding to have it. And so when, when I hear pain like that, I immediately go into doctor mode thinking about the various medicines that I can use to make that better. And to hell with what the underlying cause is, you have bad facial pain, I like to fix it. Okay, good, thank you for that. All right, another person is writing that although his or her MRI hasn't changed, the neurologist has shared that the MS has progressed from relapse remitting to secondary progressive. How is that possible, he, she, he or she, wants to know, you know, without uh, the MRI getting worse. So, so when you get an MRI and you see a new white spot or a new enhancing spot, that tells you that there's a new active acute lesion or a new bout of inflammation since the last time they imaged you. That's what that tells you. And 
getting an MRI once a year is a really good idea because it's one of the ways that we look under the hood to see how you're doing. And if your MRI is evolved and gotten worse, that's bad for you. And if your MRI has not evolved and is the same as last year, that's good. But that's not the only thing that we look at when we're trying to assess somebody with MS. In fact, it's one of three things that we look at. The most important thing that we look at is not the MRI. It's you. Because you're a you expert. You know more about you than anyone else on earth. And if I listen to you, you'll typically tell me the answer. So when I listen to you, I'm trying to figure out, are you failing the litmus test of life? Are you having the need to withdraw from activities because MS is taking away your ability to walk across a football field or to climb the bleachers or to work an eight hour shift or what have you? The second thing in order of importance is a toss up between the MRI and the MS Olympics or the testing that we do. And so we can clarify that there's progression of your disease with any of those being abnormal. It doesn't have to show up on the MRI. It could show up on your exam and it could show up in our discussion. And so to have secondary progressive MS or just to have a worsening of your MS, it doesn't just have to be on the MRI. Okay, thank you. We have time for a few more questions. First one, so we can go a little bit quicker. Given your opinion, would you take a person off of Ocrevus if their MRI had shown no new lesions in the last few years? Isn't that the purpose of Ocrevus? I would not take them off Ocrevus because that is the purpose of Ocrevus. And so maybe the reason there's nothing on the MRI is because Ocrevus was working. Exactly, thank you. Um, next one, how can a docile lesion on T11 be treated best? with physical therapy and B-cell therapy, question mark. So we don't have the ability to, to treat a specific lesion, like, like one that's right there, one that's right there. We, we, we're not able to do that. We can give steroids to quell inflammation from an acute lesion, and we can do rehabilitation with physical and occupational therapy to rehab, and we can use lotions and potions to manage chronic symptoms but we aren't unfortunately at the spot where we can treat a specific lesion with a specific treatment. I look forward to the day that we can do that, Stuart. Great, thank you. All right, uh, next person writes, um, is there anything new that can slow malignant MS? So malignant MS is a term uh, which describes very aggressive MS, like people that have attack after attack after attack and they don't get better. Um, where they accrue neurological disability really, really quickly. So malignant MS is not normal MS. And when there's malignant MS, I reach for the most aggressive therapies that I have available. So those would include things like a discussion of Lintrata or off-label Cytoxin. Um, those are the kind of things that I reach for to shut down malignant MS because it's typically driven by very severe inflammation. And so I want to grab the most potent anti-inflammatory to quell that malignant disease. Okay, thank you. Going back to Tamina from Canada, uh, going, uh, going back to the vitamin D, there are some people taking 25,000 I use a day, 10,000 I use a day, and when they hear me that I'm taking 10,000 I use a week, they're surprised. Should MS patients take more than regular people? So people impacted by MS fare well if they drive the level above 50. How you get there, um, is a discussion. So here's a way that you might not have thought about. Go out in your backyard and take off your shirt and sit in the backyard for 15 minutes. I mean, you can wear undergarments, but sit in the backyard for 15 minutes and you'll absorb vitamin D. And that's the equivalent of taking 5,000 international units. 15 minutes in the sun, shirtless, is the equivalent of 5,000 international units. So there's a million different ways of getting D, vitamin D. You can take pills, you can take all kinds of stuff. And the key is to check the level to find out where you are. Some people can take 2,000 a day and they're fine. Some people will need 50,000 twice a week. Everybody's different. Thank you. Uh, Kevin writes, if, so if T2 lesions become black holes, is that progression? That's, that is an MRI discussion. And that doesn't mean progression neurologically. So I, I, I know that it's confusing, but that, that whole discussion is an MRI discussion. So the MRI lesion has become a T1 hypointensity, but that does not mean 
that the human being has progressive disease. Thank you. All right, two more questions. Kanita writes for a 61 year old woman on Ocrevus, whose last infusion was 1220. What is the ideal time to get your COVID vaccine? Also, research, research shows longer waits for the second vaccine improve uh, immune response. Should we wait extra time for the second dose? So this is the million dollar question right there. So she just won the award. So what we've learned thus far is as follows. And I'm just gonna list a bunch of facts real quick. If you have MS, it doesn't increase the risk of contracting COVID and it doesn't increase the risk of a more severe infection. If you are on most MS medicines, taking a COVID vaccine, it doesn't impact it unless it's an S1P1 receptor Jelenia, Zyposia, Pontosoy, those medicines, or a B cell depleter, Rituxan, Ocrevus, or Kesempta. If you're on one of those medicines, it does impact, we believe, the ability to mount a B cell response against COVID. Now, it may be a partial response or it may be not at all, right? And so, so what, what the person who asked the question is saying is true the longer you wait after a B-cell depleter, the more likely you're gonna mount a response. If you are on a B-cell depleter and you take a COVID vaccine and you don't mount a full B-cell response, you will mount a full T-cell response. And the, the question which is yet to be answered is, is that enough? We don't know. And so people with MS who have been vaccinated but they're on Jelenia or similar drugs, or Ocrevus or similar drugs, I'm recommending that they wear a mask and I'm recommending they consider a booster shot of the COVID vaccine. More to come. Great, thank you for that. Kenneth is also asking, is it okay to mix J&J &J with the mRNA for a second for a booster? The, so the real answer is we don't know, but I also wanna remind people that the vaccines leave your body very quickly. So when you take a vaccine, if you look a month later, you can't find the vaccine in your body. There's no evidence of it. The effects to the immune system are persistent, but not the actual vaccine. So whereas logically you would stick with the same compound because it's less confusing, I don't think we know the answer. And in some ways, I don't think it matters. Okay. But that's just my opinion. Thank you for that. And thank you for all your answers and your dialogue tonight. We can't now take any more questions at this time because I did tell Dr. Foster he's finished at 8.15. All I do want to is remind everybody that tomorrow night we do have the program with aging and multiple sclerosis. Again, if you don't know how to get to, you know, look at all the programs we have coming up, go to the MS Views and News website, easily found on the internet. Also, we have coming up Pilates, men's issues, where it's me and two other men with MS sitting down and opening up things to do with depression, sex, and other things as well that we will be talking about, all right? That's next week, Wednesday, all right, uh, is the 18th, is that program. We have mental wellness coming up. We have a Compass Care Rural America event coming up where I was supposed to be in Greenville, South Carolina on the 21st, which is now getting removed, and we'll, we will just be doing a virtual event on that because COVID is too high in that area and people don't want to come out, so we're having to change the wheel again. All right, many people writing, thank you very much. Great program, awesome. Doc, thanks, you know, it's awesome to see you. Dr. Basta will be back intermittently doing programs with MS Views and News. And then in the middle of October, when we have our MS Symposium, which is our annual biggest event of the year, we used to draw two, 300 people at a time coming live to that event and doing it live stream, which now you know is virtual. Okay, so we always have like five, 600 people on those programs. Dr. Boster, Dr. Mary Hughes will be speaking at the MS Symposium in the middle of October. We'll have Gretchen Hawley, who's a who's a uh, uh, physical therapist, talking about the physical, obviously physical therapy. And we'll have Patricia Pagnata, who's from Central Florida, and she will be there to speak as well. She's a nurse practitioner, very well known in the state of Florida. So again, though, everybody, just listen up. We're doing 10 to 11 programs a month. We're doing them for you all, okay? Not because I have time to be sitting in front of a camera all the time. All right, so anyway, Dr. Foster, again, thank you. Kudos to everything you do. Thanks for everything that you are doing for the MS community nationwide, and uh, we bless you for being here, okay?
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and as always, it's an awesome opportunity to interact. Um, and, and I just want to thank MS Views and News formally for all of the efforts that you've made over the last year and a half. You have really set the bar so high for expectations for patient engagement and education. And I'm grateful for that. So from thank all you. of us, thank you. You guys, God bless and have a super evening, everyone. Be thank safe. You, thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. We'll see you soon.